Welcome, everyone. Um, I'd like to just start with some housekeeping. Um, if you'd like to use the subtitles um, during this um, talk, please click on the CC box and you'll go ahead and see um, live transcript at the bottom of your screen. Um, before I go any further, I'd like to acknowledge that the Center for Art and Wood is located on the land of the Lene Lenape Nation. And we honor those who steward the lands past, present, and future. And to learn more, um, please visit um, these links that I'm putting in the chat right now. Um, and thank you for joining us uh, with a talk with Scott Braun on the Decency Project. The Decency Project ranges from intimate dialogue to group conversation to performative demonstrations and sometimes even collaborative performance. Scott Braun, our guest this evening, is a visual artist, educator, um, socio-political activist whose interactive performances, sculptures, and installations engage participants in an exploration of self in the context of society. He has been artist in residence at Anderson Ranch in Colorado and Haystack in Maine. His work has been exhibited in solo and group exhibitions at the Queens Museum um, Sideshow Gallery, the Rosenthal Library, Benton Nice Gallery, Pi Ling Chen uh, Sculpture Garden at Savannah College of Art and Design, Rye Arts Center Gallery, and the American University Museum. The Decency Project has taken place in Richmond, Virginia, Washington, DC, New York City, the Center for Art and Wood and Love Park here in Philadelphia, and most recently at the Colorado School of Mines in Golden, Colorado. The project was also featured in the documentary series, The Line, that divides. Ron has worked professionally as a musician, spoken word performer, furniture designer, maker, visual artist, and educator. He has served as lecturer in sculpture at Yale School of Art, faculty of New York School of Interior Design, and assistant professor, assistant professor in the Craft Material Studies Department at VCU Arts in Richmond, Virginia. He holds a BA in Music from Berkeley College in, of Music in uh, Boston and an MFA in Studio Art and Social Practices from Queens College, SUNY New York. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Scott. Thank you, Scott. All righty. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Katie. Hi, Laura. Hi, Holly. OK, so so uh, um, I'm very excited. I think that because I'm uh, I'm looking for a new gig, I, I tried to to put a lot of vision forward and I went ahead and designed easily a two hour lecture for you. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna skip a lot of it. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna jump in and uh, and get started and and stumble our way through great big chunks and say, well, this isn't valid, the hell with this. Uh, so let's start. I think the way I do this, I go back to PowerPoint. Hold on, give me a moment. View, presenter. Back to you guys. Share screen. Okay. You should all see a single slide, right? That is fantastic. Oh, great. Okay. So the Decency Project is uh, sort of why we why we are here. Uh, I I would love to find a way to present this project uh, true to itself, uh, while at the same time sort of acknowledging that that I am a guest of the Center for Art and Wood, uh, which I'm happy about, uh, and that this programming has something to do with the Norm Sartorius uh, exhibition of uh, tons of incredible spoons. Um, but so the Decency Project is a uh, uh, project that that sort of goes by this 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 little subheading of of craft and labor as a communal conduit and and in a way it's it's really just a way for me to trick people into having difficult conversations with me uh by using spoons 
um, we we find ways to to uh, have controversial socio political socio political conversations by bonding by working together um, and and we avoid the 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 dangers of those difficult conversations by trying to maintain uh, a focus on the abstract rather than talking uh, specifically about gun rights or Roe v. Wade or Trump. Uh, we'll talk instead about the abstract theories behind them and, and we try to uh, engage in, in critical discourse. This is ideal for an empathetic confrontationalist like me. Uh, so um, there are three things, one of which we're going to skip, that I think are particularly relevant for uh, an artist talk at the center. I need to find a new place to put your face. There you go, good. Um, the, the first, whoops, the first is the one we're going to skip. So I, I do think that there are sort of inherent contradictions, uh, in, in the formal versus the conceptual or the aesthetic versus political in art. Uh, I think that, that, that those ideas create kind of a, a love hate relationship, both within and from without craft where, where the way that, that people are looking at craft, particularly from an art perspective. Uh, I would love to talk about that stuff, uh, perhaps some other time. Um, I think that's too big to tackle while we're talking about these other things. Uh, the next thing that I do want to talk about is, is the idea that, that I call historical contextualization. Um, it's easy for us to understand that nothing is created in a vacuum, right? We talk about that all the time. We're familiar with the expression, nothing is created in a vacuum. What's more difficult for us to really absorb is is the the further analysis of that statement and 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 that is that uh everything is created everything that is created is created in response to its contextual surroundings and in conversation with some sort of historical arc uh and and that's really important uh in in to to the to the next idea which is that the decency project is is quickly becoming and, and continues to become a, a pedagogy of awareness and critical thinking. I'm asking people to engage with me one by one uh, and to embrace an awareness of humanity and, and, and our past, present, future, uh, all through critical thinking. And it, it turns out that, that we kind of have a problem with critical thinking. Uh, I'm gonna go backwards for a second. In, in particularly in this country, uh, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit as well. Um, so this pedagogy sort of embraces the, the, the writings and, and thinking of a scholar named Louis Kamnitzer. Uh, Kamnitzer maintains that art is the production of knowledge. Um, and I agree. Um, the way that, that Kamnitzer kind of explains it is that uh, once upon a time, some, some long lost ancestor of ours created something uh, and it stopped everyone in their tracks and it filled them with awe. And the second, third, fourth time that that happened, we decided that we need to give that a name. Uh, and so ultimately we called it art. Um, but art begins with awe. It's, it's not included in the name, but in the inability to name it, right? And so we've been in search of reproducing art rather than in search of reproducing that awe. And, and that's where we go astray. Um, so, so Kamnitzer tells us that awe is related to the impact it has on our knowledge. Art is closer to knowledge than it is to an object. Uh, and so, so I'm, I'm going to sort of move forward with the, uh, with the assumption that we can at least kind of get on board with this idea that art is the production of knowledge. Um, just in case you want another couple of juicy tidbits from, from Kamnitzer, I threw them in my notes here. Uh, a couple of my favorite things I've heard him say are, I don't make objects, I make conditions for a new situation to emerge, which I freaking love. Uh, and, and in giving advice to young artists, he asks, what problem are you solving or investigating with this work? Share your ignorance, not your expertise. You are investigating the unknown. I love Lewis Kamnitzer. Anyway, let's continue. So uh, we're going to continue with uh, a handful of quotes. Now, 
I've been using this slide, this very slide. I have not retyped it. Uh, I've been using this very slide for at least 10 or 15 years. Uh, and this time I decided to kind of get a little deeper into why the hell do I keep using this slide? I think that at one point it was random and I was just being glib. And I liked the fact that Morris says that, that you know, uh, uh, beauty is, is the useful. And Wilde says, well, the hell with you, art is useless. And Zappa says, shut up and play your guitar. But the truth is that all three of these men have not only had a profound impact on me, but a, a pro profound impact on the way we all see art and, and the ways in which that, that, uh, that contradiction that I'm not going to talk about uh, plays out. Right, so so Morris is a poet, right? He's a he's the dreamer of dreams. He's an idealist. He's a socialist curmudgeon fighting for chasing some kind of pyrrhic victory in the aftermath of the industrial revolution. Uh, uh, Morris is is in love with the Sisyphean. He wants us to roll the boulder up the mountain every day, and he believes we'd all be the better for it. Uh, and, and he has this strict interpretation of what beauty is as not only that which is well-made, but that which is useful, strictly that which is useful. And, and, and he believes that an education of the populace in this interpretation of the arts would save all of society. Wilde, on the other hand, is an aesthete. He believes that we're nothing without beauty. Right? That quote, in fact, goes on to say that the only excuse for making a beautiful thing is that one admire it intensely. He's flippant, he's fabulous, he's brilliant, and he's also deeply concerned about the soul of mankind, which he writes about the soul of man under socialism. Uh, and, and so, of course, we destroyed him. And, and now Zappa uh, is, to me, the same level of historical level genius. Um, by the way, anybody who follows me on Instagram, my Instagram uh, handle is the acronym for shut up and play your guitar. Uh, um, so <clears throat> Zappa is a guy who is completely irreverent, irre ir hmm, irreverent. Uh, he's crude and profane. He's cynical. He's disgusted. Uh, but he is equally concerned with the direction and the potential salvation of humanity in, in what he does both in and, and out of his, of his music. He, he did a lot of uh, political uh, work, particularly in, the, in his later years. I got to see him speak with the, uh, the PM, uh, during the PMRC hearings. Uh, when was that, 80s? Anyway, brilliant dude. So all three of these really wildly divergent perspectives on how one should approach and appreciate art still somehow resonate with Chemnitzer's, Chemnitzer's notion that art is the production of knowledge. So we're going to take those three quotes. We're going to add to them uh, a quote from a, this gentleman here. Uh, these, by the way, is the cigarette series. Um, this is Grover Lewis, who was a, a music critic for Rolling Stone, The Village Voice, back in the uh, late 50s through the 70s. Uh, brilliant writer, really, really uh, interesting writer and, and interesting guy. Um, he was a, writing an, an article or trying to write an article about uh, a famous blues guitarist named Lightning Hopkins. I told you it was a cigarette series. Now, Lightning Hopkins was, uh, you know, he's sort of thought of as one of the top 100 guitar players of all time. He was a very famous blues guitarist. Uh, and he was a kind of a fuck up, you know, he was, he was uh, uh, a, a drunken recluse, he was a hermit, he was off the grid completely. Uh, he was the, the sort of quintessential brilliant artist that no one could touch. Uh, and so Grover Lewis was sent by the Village Voice in the early 60s to Dallas to go find Lightning Hopkins and write about him. Um, and in doing so, uh, he finally published in 1968 an article in the Village Voice called Looking for Lightning. Um, and, and I pulled a quote out of that article that has been with me also for a very, very long time, many years. And I want to read it to you. Um, he writes, unlike many in my generation, 
he'd passed far beyond the lacrimose self-pitying posture that accompanies a frightened solipsistic preoccupation with survival. Accepting the bedrock necessity of unceasing struggle for existence as a simple inflexible condition of life, he had summoned up the strength, courage, and raw marrow to forge ahead and confront a vaster dilemma, the problem of fashioning something outside of oneself worthy of continued life. This quote has smashed me in the face over and over again for years. Any of us who've gone through our lives as overly aware, overly sensitive, creative people probably live with some level of depression. We live in lacrimose self-pitying postures. We have a frightened solipsistic preoccupation with survival. And I've fallen in love over and over again with this idea of the vaster dilemma. My attention is, is really often consumed with the pursuit of something outside myself worthy of continued life. So much so that this quote became the basis of my thesis show when, when I was in grad school. That's the wall text from, from the opening of my thesis show. So first of all, how the hell does an old man like me wind up in grad school in 2014? Uh, that's something we should talk about. Uh, and and um, I think the way to do that is to jump backwards to the beginning. Just for a few minutes, I'm gonna I'm gonna truncate this uh, a bit, but but let's start with the beginning. So so most of us who who obsess about the vaster dilemma um, can remember when it is that we first became aware sociopolitically when we sort of came online in our lives, and for me that was in my early mid teens, uh, in the late seventies, early eighties. So, so for that was that was kind of a peculiar time, right? Uh, um, it's this moment in history where governments in the United States and the UK are driving a conservative movement towards civil rights abuses and income inequality. We had a deadly disease sweeping through cities all over the world. Uh, the U.S. government was not only incompetent in dealing with it, but actively spreading disinformation, refusing to address it publicly and purposefully doing harm to its own citizens for political and hateful reasons. Luckily for us, that could never happen again. Um, and, and, you know, we can at least count on the fact that it won't slowly deteriorate into more comical buffoonery that, that just becomes a, a, a cartoon show. Um, and at the very least, we can, we can kind of console ourselves with the idea that it could never sort of expand internationally to a point where it becomes more dangerous than it is comical. Okay, let's just pause for a second. <laughs> I'm being flippant and cavalier. Uh, that's the Oscar Wilde in me. Um, but I, I do this as a way to point out the context in which we live and try to begin to touch on the conversation that my work is trying to have, right? So. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to have this conversation with a series of contextual arcs. And, and so I, I bring up the Bauhaus because I think they're a great example of the historical contextualization I'm talking about. Without understanding that the Nazi party chased Mies van der Rohe and his Jewish communist degenerates out of Germany, we don't understand why they moved to the United States without knowing that Chicago had burned to the ground in the previous generation and is quickly becoming an architectural capital of the world, we don't understand why they chose Chicago, right? And of course, this context also has a massive influence on the aesthetic direction of modernist design. So let's do a quick rundown of who the hell I am and how the hell I got here and, and take it forward to the Decency Project. Leading into and during those Reagan-Thatcher years, I was a young musician in New York City. This picture was taken in 1983. Uh, by the end of 1984, 8,000 American men had died. It's the end of 1985 before Ronald Reagan says the word AIDS out loud in public. It's not addressed in Congress until this picture is taken in February of 1986 by which point there are 16,000 American men dead. As a bisexual artist in New York City, it's a pretty short trip to becoming an activist punk. 
and an angry, cynical, and completely irreverent musician and spoken word performer. This is from the mid 90s. So my intention here was to take you as we go forward through sort of at, at age 30, in 1995, I, I went to apprentice to John Fisher, a furniture maker in Brooklyn, who is a master craftsman. And, and uh, my intent was to sort of take you through that whole arc of my career. And I think we're just going to blast through it. And suffice it to say that I learned a lot with John. And then I kind of got disgusted at the Oscar Wildness of, his, of the work he was doing. And I went back to my William Morris roots and started making cabinetry for people and then wound up starting my own shop and then built a, a whole pile of furniture for a whole pile of different people who eventually let me start designing and, and bringing my own voice to the table. And then I went back to my Morris roots again and I started designing a line and trying to be simple and pure and idealist. And that continued to grow more and more advanced until it began to kind of put me on the map. Uh, and I don't know why these next three slides are here. Uh, and 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 then I continued to sort of make my own designs, and then suddenly I'm I'm sort of developing a name for myself, uh, and and until I'm getting sort of superstar prices for work that takes forever to make. By the way, if if you didn't see Kate Hawes's lecture recently, Kate built most of this piece. Uh, I just came in and did the uh, the glory work. I did I designed the piece and I did all the carving. Uh, but but Kate mostly built this 15 feet away from me while I was building this. Uh, and these pieces really sort of put me in, in the public eye uh, in, a, in a much larger way. Anyway, let's just, we'll keep zooming. So I continued to make things. I started ma making things for other companies, but ultimately I was finding the work kind of unfulfilling. And so I started to venture into sculpture and trying to find a way to, to go backwards and pull pull those those activist roots in you know trying to figure out how the hell do I marry my hands and my head uh, and so uh, this kind of work eventually led to me teaching at Yale for a few years uh, where I really began to kind of embrace this idea that I could just be conceptual entirely I'm gonna again sort of keep blasting through here and not give you too much information about any specific thing. I, I started to get more and more conceptual uh, um, and finally, eventually began to find my way towards the protest art that I was, I think, seeking. Uh, and, and then went and did a residency at Anderson Ranch. Uh, and in order to get comfortable, I immediately did something formal uh, and, and purely aesthetic. And But then immediately began to research objects of torture that were used historically against blasphemers and homosexuals. Uh, this is something called the Judas chair. I made my own version of the Judas chair. Uh, I, I was also, uh, this is 2012, and so there was a lot of uh, 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 legislation being, being pursued uh, in limiting women's reproductive rights. Oh, we thought we got over that, huh? So this is uh, my take on, on how, uh, according to the Quran and the Talmud, how a woman is uh, stoned to death for the crime of adultery. Um, and, and that led me to grad school. And in grad school, again, I settled in, I made some formal sculpture, I investigated the early Bauhaus, I, I fell in love with Kandinsky and the, and the, the abstraction of, of the, the early Bauhaus. Uh, and, and I let that guide me again back towards those sort of uh, uh, protest roots uh, and again kind of getting into conceptual objects um, again sort of with protest in mind um, and and slowly as I as I was offered something at the, uh, the Queens Museum I started to get more engaged with interactive work and so I'm not going to explain this right now we're just going to keep going but uh, a lot of this work becomes interactive uh, and sort of highly conceptual. Um, but again, it leads me to these interactive and, and in fact performative works that ultimately become conversational. Uh, and now, now I'm really socially engaged. And so, and so by the time I leave grad school, 
by the way, I've been teaching my day job through grad school is teaching uh, straight up furniture design at the at the New York School of Interior Design. So so I've got a foot in design and I've got a foot in the fine arts. Um, and then suddenly I get offered this opportunity. This slide, I'm not going to explain it, but it is based on the concept of social literacy uh, that that I uh, swam around in with the uh, contemporary philosopher Tracy Ann Esoglu. Tracy and I spent uh, lots of coffee and cigarettes together, uh, finding our way to how does one go from a socially illiterate culture to an empathic civilization. Uh, I recommend Tracy's writings without uh, reservation. Anyway, all of this lands me in the craft department of uh, VCU Arts in Richmond. And I look out my back window and there's a statue of Robert E. Lee. And as I kind of swim around in that and think, well, what kind of work am I gonna do in Richmond? Uh, I'm aware that I need to kind of find a way to embrace craft, which is something I hadn't really felt part of, at least communal, commun in terms of the craft community. Uh, I have to, I'm gonna have to find a way to embrace that. And, and I'd like to address this thing I'm looking at out my back window. Uh, and my immediate, my immediate idea was I wanted to rent a storefront and just hang a banner that said, I'm a New York Jew, help me understand. Uh, but I wanted to live. Um, and so I, I started thinking about ways that I could get people to come and sit with me. Um, Richmond is this little sort of oasis that, you know, if you go two minutes outside of Richmond, you're really in, uh, conservative territory. And, and so I, I, I saw a lot more of that than you would see in New York City. Uh, and I wanted to, I wanted to interact with these people. And so, uh, I started thinking about, about trying to make appointments with people and, and, and make objects together. And I wasn't really clear exactly yet on what kind of objects I wanted to make. I knew that they'd have to be simple. Um, and then COVID hit and everything shut down. And so I quickly cobbled together a, uh, a little shave horse that I could use in my apartment uh, during lockdown and I brought it up to DC with me where I, where I live and, and put it on the balcony and settled ultimately on all I can get are, is scraps of wood. And so I'm gonna learn to make spoons. And uh, it was a little random to be honest with you, uh, but, but I am an academic and, and I fancy myself a little bit of a scholar. And so my friends are academics and people who fancy themselves a little bit of scholars. And so it led to a lot of conversations about why spoons. Um, and so as I kind of sat on my balcony and, 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 and did my little balcony workshop, uh, that spoon by the way, Wait, on is there? There's such a there's a laser pointer, right? Isn't there a? We can see your 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 arrow. Oh, you can. This yeah, spoon right yeah. here. I didn't make this one. This was made by my my spoon guru, jo, Joe John Paul. We're going to talk about him in a minute. Uh, that was a gift from Joe. Uh, actually, several of these are made by Joe. Where's my spoons? Doesn't matter. It's an old slide. Okay, so so let's go backwards to, to this slide while I talk about this. So um, <clears throat> uh, one of the things that I, I happened on is is there is an ancient thing called the allegory of the spoon, and it it goes all the way back to to like ancient Judaism and Confucianism. In in which case, they, it's the the allegory of the chopsticks. Uh, but but essentially, it's this really wonderful tale in which uh, a prophet is given an audience with God. And uh, he, he, he appears before God and, and, and asks, God, God allows him to ask a single question. And, and he, she, they ask, I'm gonna go with that. They ask, uh, what is the difference between heaven and hell? And God says, excellent question, come with me. 
And so they they walked down this long hallway where there were two doors and 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 God opens the first door and and uh, looking in that first door, the the prophet sees a room, a mass of people filled with people, and they're they're miserable and and angry and starving, and there's just just misery and flies and 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 as he looks closer, he realizes that at the center of the room there's this pedestal. And on the pedestal is this giant bowl of delicious smelling stew. And as he continues to look closer, he sees that every person has lashed to their arm this very long, you know, picture like three to six foot long spoon. And, and with that spoon, they can reach the bowl, but they can't feed themselves. And so they're all dying and starving and miserable. And God says, this is hell, closes the door. And he takes the prophet down to the to the next door and he opens the door and lo and behold to use the proper language uh it's the same scene there's the pedestal there's the bowl of stew there's all the people with the spoons lashed to their arm but as he watches as they watch more more closely what they see is that the people are able to reach the bowl with their spoon and feed each other and God says, and this is heaven, and closes the door. And that's the allegory. And, and I thought that that was, you know, for, for a pinko kami atheist like me, that was, that was a really wonderful kind of, hey, that's what religion is for. So anyway, I, I really embraced that as an idea of, I'm, I'm going to start this thing with spoons. So, so by the time I get back to Richmond, things look a little different. And, uh, and things are a little more charged. And I find myself in conversation with people that maybe this isn't gonna be the simplest conversation. And so I set out to create an object that I could take around with me and attract attention and make appointments if possible, but really just hang out in parks and, and find ways to get people's attention to come and sit and talk with me uh, and have conversations while I teach them to carve a spoon and we sit and we work together. And, and another little, little tale that I'll throw in there just that, that stuck out to me about how we bond through work, through labor, was I remembered uh, uh, my, my I had a relative who, who had been taken to uh, landlord tenant court. They were being evicted. And, uh, and at the time I used to bounce back and forth between my shop and the New York School of Interior Design. And uh, I had to run to court this day to go and help her. And so I was wearing like jeans and work boots and a dress shirt and tie and a, and a blazer. Uh, real geography teacher look. And so, so uh, I get there and the landlord is, is sitting it's, it's a very contentious situation and he's sitting there with like an oxygen mask and he's trying to make things look like, oh, he's a decrepit old man. And, and the lawyers are there. And finally I walk over to the landlord and I tell the lawyers, look, go, go down the hall. And I kind of crouch down in front of this guy and I introduce myself and I, we start having a conversation and it's really antagonistic. And after a couple of minutes, he looks down and he says to me, are those steel toes? What do you do? And I said, I'm a furniture maker. And 10 minutes later, we were all done and walking out and we never went inside the court and the lawyers didn't have to get involved and we had settled the whole problem. And, and I remembered that too, as I thought about the way that we can find ways to bond uh, through labor, right? We work with people all the time that we don't agree with, but we get our jobs done. So how can we use that, right? How can we take that conversation that we all had for that three, four, five, it's now going on six, seven years where we have a perfectly pleasant conversation with a stranger until someone says something that makes us all go, oh, you're one of those. Let's have that in reverse, right? Let me find these people and get them to sit down and have a conversation with me. And so, as I created these objects, I thought about historical contextualization, I thought about artist production of knowledge, and I started thinking about 
messages that that I could very quietly put in there that I don't have to talk about unless I'm sitting here with a group of people like you, right? I can tell you that this design, if if you're not aware of it, comes from Elisitsky's Beat the Whites with the Red Wedge. This is a constructivist, Bolshevist propaganda poster that is that is the start of the labor movement in 1919 Russia. Uh, and I'm going to do a quick little aside here, because in doing research for this, I happened to discover that El Lissitsky, it's widely considered, took this idea from Vladislav Straminsky. I know I butchered that name and I apologize. Uh, this poster, Create the Week of the Red Gift uh, every week. I'm sorry, Create the Week of the Red Gift everywhere from May of 1919. This piece comes from much uh, later that year. Um, and so I also used this in a piece that I did uh, for uh, Craft Desert's uh, Small Acts of Subversion show. Um, it's a direct ripoff. I took all of this and did it in hammered metals um, with raised letters. Um, and so I was able to do a text piece that, that is not just uh, just the text. Um, and what I did is I, I, I hung this on the wall with postcards uh, classifying the way that we break down into race, class, gender, and ableness. And I asked people to write some small act of progress uh, on the back of those postcards and drop them on the floor. Um, some of which say things like, I'll wear cool ass shit and no one, nobody gi can give a fuck but me. But some of them were more meaningful. So anyway, uh, back to the decency project. So the first place that I did it in any official capacity outside of Richmond, uh, I was invited to come up to Queens, New York and do it in a park in Flushing, which is the most uh, diverse community in the world. Uh, there are more languages spoken in Flushing or Jackson Heights anyway, uh, than anywhere else in the world. Uh, and we had translators. And I had some incredible conversations with incredible people. Uh, this uh, uh, Eastern European couple had some really insightful ideas about how the kitchen is the center of our home and the spoon is the center of the kitchen and how our mom disciplines us by spanking us with the wooden spoon. It was really fun. Uh, and and uh, I got to meet uh, a Chinese carver who, brought, who ran home and, and went and got some of his carvings to, to talk with me. Um, and then, and then we went, uh, on another trip, I went up back to New York to, uh, uh, up to, I'm blanking on the name of the park up in Inwood. This is Joe John Paul sitting with me. Joe is my spoon guru. Every time I have a question of how the hell do I do this, which continues to this day, I am really not a master. Uh, I, I look to Joe, um, so Joe happened to be there and, and we sat and carved some spoons together. This was kind of an artist visit. These are scholars, uh, Olga Kopenkina and my mentor, Greg Shalette from grad school, two brilliant scholars, uh, having apparently a very serious conversation. Uh, and here uh, I'm telling them about the allegory of the spoon and uh, Joe decides to jump in and participate with me. Uh, and uh, we were joined by uh, Regine Lays and Priscilla Stadler and Dario Moore. Some really incredible artists came and sat and carved and, uh, and talked about decency. And, and that's how we start every time I try to, like, like, like I did in the work before, is we come back to how do we define decency and how do we define shame? And we do that while we just carve. Uh, and, and it develops into these really wonderful large conversations that sometimes turn into big demonstrations. Uh, and and uh, yeah, demonstrations. And, and sometimes even this is, this, is uh, this, this day, once it started to rain, we kind of huddled into the tree and it turned into a collaborative performance, uh, which was really great fun. Um, and and you know this 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 project has traveled around and and you know later I went to Philly and and the center was was nice enough to to host me first uh, for two days one day I was outside the the center 
uh, having fantastic conversations with with uh, a, a pretty interesting variety of people. Uh, well, th I had a great conversation with this kid, but I'm going to skip it. Uh, and then the next day we went to we went to uh, Love Park, and uh, there was a women's march going on that day, and and we started the day with this incredible conversation with this woman. Uh, Katie, do you remember her name? I, I'm forgetting her name now. I don't That's, actually. I, I meant to put it in my notes. I have it. I write notes about every conversation. I have, I have it. But it just, just wow, what a way to start the day. She just, she sat down and unloaded on us all of the 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 bullying she had encountered on the bus that day, and 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 it just turned into this really wonderful, warm conversation. And she carved the spoon and. And went on her way, and then this this lovely couple came and joined me, who I had met the day before, and and then we were joined by the, joined by this this uh, Aussie and and uh, his wife, who kind of didn't really want to get involved. I, I I give them a year anyway. So so, uh, <laughs> uh, but we had a great day, and and I get to meet all of these interesting and interested people and have conversations that are generally really difficult. Uh, and sometimes it's just play. Um, and, 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 you know, the question often comes up of whether or not, is it about the spoons at all? Right. I, 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 I took this photograph and I call it sustenance in five conversations, but I don't care. I mean, when I did that, I will, I will, all right, damn it, we'll talk about form. So, so uh, you talked me into it. Uh, no, I'm going to skip it. I'm sorry. I'm going on. Anyway, it continues on. This is the sun setting on the statue for the final time. I went out and, and carved spoons with people on that last night. Uh, and the very next day, they took that motherfucker down. <laughs> Uh, and so in the aftermath of that, I was invited to the Branch Museum, who was who was hosting a really incredible exhibit called Reframing Prote Protest. The Branch Museum is right there in Richmond on Monument Avenue, uh, curated by uh, this fellow right here, Tarin jo uh, uh, shit, Jones. Yes. Anyway, uh, we had some, this woman's face is blacked out because uh, Many of the people that I speak to who are on the more conservative side uh, don't want their pictures taken. They don't want to be videotaped. Uh, and so documenting this has become sort of sometimes problematic. But anyway, we, we spent a day out front. We spent a day in the uh, another day in the backyard, uh, just in in groups and 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 I get to meet sort of all kinds of fun people and everybody gets to carve a spoon and spend time together talking and and it takes new form every time there there become these themes with every new iteration of the of the performance and the one that has taken it the furthest is uh, earlier this spring i was invited to the colorado school of mines and uh i was invited by that that man waving over there who who uh is named Dr. Yitz Finch. He's an engineer. Uh, and uh, Yitz and I shared a shop together back in the late 30s. Um, and uh, Yitz asked me to come and, and do my thing and hang out for a few days. That's, and what that's referred to as the Yitz Finch years, by the way, in your okay, yes, school. okay, yes. <laughs> so, uh, so again, I got to have uh, some incredible conversations. Uh, this was right immediately after the leak of the upcoming Roe v. Wade decision. Uh, this kid right here grew up on a on a ranch and wanted to talk about gun rights because he needs to be able to shoot animals that put him in danger uh, and his livelihood, and so on and so on. It was just it was a, a series of great conversations. Uh, but but uh, what really made it incredibly special was this group of people so so here we have this is yitz the engineer this is a uh, a master student a grad student in quantum theory named hunter solomon this i'll go over to the one side for a second this is uh axel mole who is a uh a, a phd quantum theorist 
and his uh, incredibly energetic wife, Katerina uh, Lin, who is uh, a, an environmental economist. These were some wicked smart people. And, and we spent three days together, nonstop, carving spoons, eating ice cream with the spoons, being silly, and just having nonstop conversations about the ways in which the pedagogy of fine art and science are the same. And the ways in which we need to be able to find ways to use that similarity to bridge that gap. Um, Axel's mentor is a man named uh, Lincoln Carr. I'm not going to get too deeply into it, uh, but but Lincoln Carr is a quantum theorist and a physicist who who uh, lectures frequently on what's wrong with STEM theory, what's wrong with a STEM curriculum, and the need to incorporate humanities back into uh, what we do. And and I just I just watched an incredible lecture that he gave at, at the Aspen Physics Center. Is that right? Yeah, it's at the Aspen Science Center. I feel like Aspen Center for Physics, maybe. I, I don't know. I know that um, they do have like a big conference or something up there either every year or every other year. And it's this big conference. What, what is there? What's the name of the place? Oh, Aspen. I mean, it's in oh, the Aspen. School. It's, it's, it's Aspen it's, Center for Physics. Is that it? I believe it's up in the ski town. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, um, these conversations got really deep and really far reaching because th these these people really just put their lives on hold and spent three days with me, and it was amazing. And 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 you know, at, at the end, we we you know, kind of, I I gifted everyone uh, a spoon, and and yes, I'm still working on yours. I apologize. Not everybody stayed awake through all these conversations, um, but but ultimately, all of it was lubricated by the spoon, right? And and I, I want to, I'm going to close this window, but I want to sort of close the, the, the presentation part of this by telling you a little something of, of what went on, particularly with Katerina and I and, and uh, the whole group. For in, in one afternoon, uh, I, we spent a while talking. They, they had, Katerina had seen uh, a one of Malevich's painted squares uh, juxtaposed against uh, what I can only assume was some European 19th century version of the Hudson River painters, a big landscape. And uh, and Katerina was was uh, sort of aghast at this juxtaposition. Didn't know Malevich, didn't understand Malevich, and so we had a long conversation about the way that we approach art and the way that we talk uh, first in, in we, we do a formal analysis and we, we talk only about what is observable fact and then we go from there into an a, a uh, interpretive analysis and we begin to kind of pull out bits of, of interpretable, interpretable ideas uh, and ultimately that results in 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 critique, in the critical theory that we don't teach in the United States because the guy who really kind of solidified it all after first being invented in the 1100s in Persia and later being embraced by the Greeks, but really the one who brought critical theory as we know it today was a dude from the middle of the 19th century that we don't like because of something else he wrote called the Communist Manifesto. And so we don't learn about Marx because he's a commie, but he's also a brilliant philosopher. And in other parts of the world, they teach his philosophy because he happened. So as we kind of wove our way through all that, and, and, and I gave cont contextual history to Malevich, and, and Katerina suddenly sort of fell in love with, with the, the painting out of nowhere, I finally turned to Axel and said, you know, we've had this whole conversation. I have to confess, I don't really know what quantum theory is. And, and everyone laughed and, and Axel stayed quiet. He's a man of very few words. Uh, but Axel's student jumped up and said, I can explain it to you in three minutes. I said, all right, hit me. 
So in three minutes, he threw a bunch of quantum theory ideas at me. And each of them, I was able to wrap my head around. I understood. I was like, cool, got it. All right, move on. And, and he went through it. We got to the end. And, uh, and I said, that was, that was amazing. And I understood everything you just said. And I still have no idea what quantum theory is. And, and Axel, as I say, man, a few words. Axel said, and you still haven't told us what art is. I love that, Scott. So do I. <laughs> so do I. So anyway, I, I'm done. I, 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 I'd love to talk and hear what you all have to say. I, I just, that trip particularly has turned this into a pursuit of, of, a, of a greater pedagogy of awareness. Uh, and I continue to carve spoons with people and and trick them into having difficult conversations. And and I hope I hope I get a chance to do it with everybody I'm looking at right now. Absolutely. We do have um, one question so far in the chat, and that's from Carolyn. And Diane also has the same question as how do you actually begin the conversation? I mean, well, what does that happen? I, I, I sort of, I set it up, right? I begin by telling people, this is what we're doing, right? So it's not a, it's not a, a it doesn't happen out of nowhere. And I say, well, we're gonna, we, we're gonna talk about some, some difficult things. I wanna know what you think it means to be human. And, and I wanna start, I always start by saying, let's just start with easy. How do you define decency? What does that mean? And invariably, I get really different, particularly if it's if there are several people there, we get we get different takes on what that means. Uh, sometimes it it uh, it comes from within. Uh, sometimes it comes uh, it, it is a, an outward thing, the way that you treat other people. Uh, just just recently, I think it was at the branch. I, somebody somebody began to talk about. Uh, we had to talk about it in a way that I had never heard yet was uh, to them it was about making themselves approachable and accessible to, to anyone else. Uh, and that was a new, really kind of interesting way. And that, that went off for hours. Uh, and then from there, we, we say, all right, well, what, what is the opposite of decency? And, and I try not to let that get too far into ugliness and instead try to kind of steer it towards shame. Why do we, why do we experience shame? For what should we experience shame? Uh, and, and, and what do we experience shame for instead? Um, and, and by then we're usually off to the races. There's, there's something else that wants to be talked about. There's some something that's recent in the news. Um, and I always just try to find a way to bring it to the abstract, right? I'll, I'll, I have a, a, in my pocket at all times some, some sort of abstracted ideas that, that, will, that I use. Uh, one of my favorites is to say that we, are, we live on the banks of a, of a river and someone from a village downstream comes to visit us and says, you're pooping in the river and it's a problem. So now I ask my visitor, what should, what should we do? That kid that I wanted to talk about, he, his, he was a, a, an engineer it's, and, and immediately began talking about septic systems and how to create, you know, it was really fun. But uh, yeah, it always begins there. And with this, because this project is evolving and, and you're, growing it into a bigger project. Um, do you plan on touring the entire United States and, and maybe hitting every state? The world. The world. Yeah, I think big, I, right? Go big. It's, or go it's home, less right? important to me. It's less important to me to hit every state than it is to I want to do this in Jerusalem. I want to do this in Ukraine. I, I want to do this in in I want to do this everywhere. Um, I was part of a, a a group of people. I was invited to be to be part of this symposium of people, artists from all over the world, mostly leftist artists, 
uh, in the immediate aftermath of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And it was ugly for the, for the, the first session was, was really, really difficult. And the artists in Ukraine were, were angry and, and passionate towards the Russian artists. Having just overthrown a right-wing government of their own, they wanted to know what the Russians were doing about this problem. And, and they asked a question that, that rings in my ears and haunts me in my sleep. What does it mean you stand with Ukraine? I am dying. I am being shot at. What are you doing? This is a comfy apartment. And I'm never going to forget that question. So yeah, I want to go everywhere. I saw another question come in. Yeah, we've got an hour. Um, could you go into more depth on the um, Vaster Dilemma? The Vaster Dilemma. Do you yeah. mean the, the dilemma itself or the, the show? The dilemma itself. I feel like that this could be a very loaded question though. Well, it is, right? But it's, it's you know, just for, for the rest of you, Guth Guthrie is a, is a young man who is looking to uh, go into university next year and has gotten in touch with me to, uh, to just for some advice. And, and we're going to have a Zoom meeting later this week to talk about that. But, but if, if I read you correctly from what I've seen of you, Guthrie, and, and, and where I think you may be headed, Being alive is hard. Walking the earth is, is, is work. Dealing with other people is work. And, and accepting that it all is as it is, is work. And, and, and in that quote, what, what stood out to, to Grover Lewis about Lightning Hopkins was that he's gone beyond this, this sort of this sad self-pitying existence that we all have and has just taken struggle as an inflexible condition of life. You're gonna struggle. Now, what are you gonna do with that? What does it mean to stand with Ukraine? It's the same question. It's the same question. How, how do I fashion something outside of myself that is worthy of continued life? I love carving spoons, but that is a much, much more interesting thing to think about for me. And so I use this as lubricant. Here we go. Let's go. Let's have that conversation. What is worthy of continued life? Does that answer your question? It does. Yeah. I'm trying to write it, write it down so I don't forget. That. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Start reading philosophy. Go go back to the Persian. This is also recorded, so you can always watch it again. Oh yeah, that's right. That's okay. right. Yeah, I, I've gotten a little bit into philosophy stuff, but not not to the extent where I can use any of it in my day to day life yet. But hopefully, I'll get to that point. Well, I mean, we're never going to get to it, really, but. But I think that's where I was headed with the conversation about craft is that is that in the fine arts, starting mid 20th century and actually no starting the beginning of the 20th century, we begin to embrace the history of philosophy as a as a an underlying conversation within the arts. Uh, we don't we don't really do that in craft. Uh, at least not nearly to the extent that it was that it has happened in the fine arts, and and uh, and I'd like to see it happen. I think it's inevitable that it does happen, but but as it as it finds its way, you know, it's look. I wasn't able to convince VCU to embrace that. I'm I'm no longer at VCU, and I'm I'm looking for the next thing. But but it's important enough to me that that that's the, the hill I died on.
and and I'll go on and find another another gig. So so uh, I I think you're you're bound to to wind up studying that in school. I hope. I definitely hope I am. I hope I get to look into more of that. Oh, I missed waving goodbye to Kenna. Kenna Hazelwood, who just left us, is a force of nature that I used to paddle with in the East River. Hmm. I wanted her to be involved in this conversation. This has been wonderful, Scott. Thank you so much for sharing with us tonight. And 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 you know, you're you're part of the center family. So um uh, we we you know support the idea and just the movement of of bringing philosophy into craft and having the evolution and um you know health, healthy discourse also with with craft and and life because craft is a part of our life our everyday life and so that we should we should have that spoon yes <laughs> delicious. Yeah, no, thank you so much for having me. The the center has been amazing to me, for me. And 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 this was really fun. Thank you all for coming. And we, we hope to have you <clears throat> come out at some point again. So if any of you are in the Philadelphia area, please, uh, when we do have Scott uh, come out, you know, keep checking our events page for upcoming events, uh, which we have one coming up uh, next Friday. We have our opening of our residency exhibition overlap the Wingate Wood Artists Residency Program and um, that opens Friday August 5th um, please join us for that celebration um, you know we'll have all the um, fellows there to celebrate as well as their art on display and that runs through October 23rd um, so please um, check it out and um, again I'd like to thank all of you for for coming and, and taking the time to uh, spend with us and talk about what decency is. Um, and uh, please take care and be well and be kind to each other. I like that. And Nashe, you and I are going to carve a spoon eventually. Um, yes, I've been meaning to carve a spoon with you, Scott. I know. I know. <laughs> I, I had a couple of things to say to Scott. I don't, I mean, can we keep the meeting yeah. open? And well, I, I, well, uh, okay. So I was somebody asked as how does Scott start the conversation, and and my experience uh, having carved a spoon, uh, which I don't have here. It's in it's in my machine shop, but S Scott started the conversation, and my response was shut up. I'm carving a spoon. I just I couldn't talk and carve a spoon at the same time. So I have I have to learn how to talk and carve a spoon at the same time. I just want you to know that Mrs. Finch's cooking spoon is, is almost done. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> oh, I do have a question for you, Scott. I've been meaning to ask you this for a while. Do you think um, people's willingness to talk to you is from how um, the person they um, perceive you to be when they look at you? Because they look at you and they might um, see a particular person, whether or not that is aligned with who you are or not. And that might make them more willing to talk to you as opposed to talking to someone else. 100%, 100%. There's a, you know, we, we're all aware of uh, the Black Panther Party. Fewer of us are aware of the White Panther Party, which is not what you would think. Um, it's it's a group of white people who use their privilege to help. I, I know that people can have, you know, that that pair, that couple on the street with the AR-15s are going to talk to me, or at least they'll 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 begin a conversation with me. It ends sometimes quickly, but but they're willing to engage me in a way that is very different from the way that they're willing to engage you. 
and and exactly that's yeah. exactly what I'm um, referring to. Yeah, yeah, no, and that's that's huge. It's a huge part of it. Is is you know what what can I do with this face and this you know sort of dirtbag dress and 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 steel toed shoes that that is worthwhile and and make use of the fact that I am not as I seem at first glance. Uh, I mean, nobody is what they seem at first glance, but yeah, I guess I said that wrong. the way the way people are perceived is nevertheless a part of day to day life. If say if you and I were walking down the street having a conversation, the way someone would perceive you is a lot different than the way someone would perceive me. And it's not something that I'm okay with. It's just something that is. And I am still trying to um, figure out ways to work within that. And I mean, because there's no choice. There's just, right. um, it just is. Like, I'm aware, like, say for instance, um, Nava and I walk down to the CVS down the street from the center. Mm -hmm. Despite, I mean, the way she's going to be perceived is entirely different from the way I'm going to be perceived. And we're both people of color. So that's just, you know, something I think, something I think about in terms of your project, especially because if I feel like if I were to try a similar project, I don't think people would talk to me because they look at me and perceive something. I don't, honestly, I'm not responsible for what other people perceive when they look at me. I'm just responsible for being the person that I am. But nevertheless, there's still going to be a certain perception, um, whether I'm aware of it or not, that is going to happen. Um, when I take up the space that I take up in this world. And that's the same for everybody else. But so Nashe, if, if, if we think about this as, as uh, in, in, go back, go back to the idea of historical contextualization. Mm -hmm. Go back to the idea that we are each, each of us having a conversation with the past, right? So, so there is some arc that leads to me standing sitting here today doing what I do as I am, right? And, and my predecessors in, in this particular type of, of art are Sam Durant and Suzanne Lacey and Meryl Eucalys and, and white people who do similar things to what I do. I think that if you were to do what I do, there would be a slightly different arc and that arc would include people like Adrian Piper and, and uh, uh, um, I don't know, uh, Rick Lowe or, or not the Astor, but the Astor Gates. Like there's a, there's a, there is a, a, another lineage that is concurrent. Exactly, you, and there is a specific, um, I wrote in my MA, in my in my own MFA thesis how that how there is a specific lineage that I am following that leads to me doing what I do that includes people like Faith Rangold and Frida yes. Kahlo and yes. George O'Keefe and pe just people like that that I mean it's changed now because what I'm doing is changing the reasons why I'm doing it is changing but I still consider that my creative lineage. And I basically devoted a chapter in my MFA thesis to that idea. And I explored how it um, leads to, uh, it leads to the artist that I am. And as I'm listening to you, I'm still working, I'm sketching and I'm incorporating. I know somehow that the ideas that I'm thinking about are gonna be incorporated somewhere in something that I do. And it may not be the thing I'm doing now, but it will be, it will appear somewhere because that's just the way my mind works. And that's, I'm okay with it. Um, yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah. But, but, but the trick is if my arc and your arc can weave and intertwine, then we've done right. 
I'm I'm extremely fortunate for the people who whose arcs have intertwined with mine and the organizations and the artwork and um like right now I feel like I'm incorporating craft into my way of thinking more than I ever have not with wood but with fiber as I'm doing more with not only being a knitter although it's kind of hot to knit right now but um I'm getting into um little by little I'm getting into embroidery and things like that so that's something that um I've Again, that's pulling um people like the G's Ben Quilters back into like back into the conversation as part of my own creative lineage. So it's just it's it's I, I tend to realize that I'm revisiting ideas. <laughs> like I I graduated from my MFA program in 2015. So it's it's funny how ideas come back around. Over and over. Can we have the two of you connected? On Instagram, yes. Okay. We're okay. old friends, me and Nashia. <laughs> yeah. No, Sorry, I, I Kate, know. didn't know we had a conversation. Right, right. I just wanted to make sure that you guys were connected. So, um, which I would hope. Yeah, Scott, let's continue this conversation. Um, yes, when I, I agree. It's a good one. It is. Oz, did you want to say something before we go? Yes, but that's okay. It's it's not super relevant. That's all right. Oz Bender, ladies and gentlemen, the smartest person in the room. <laughs> you should um you should come to Brockway, Pennsylvania. I think you would have a really interesting experience here. We've we've talked about the 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 people you've encountered out there. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I, I do want this to continue to travel. I've been in five states. I, I am, am looking forward to more. I, I think, Nashe, what you were saying about like the, the, the part of Scott's work that comes from him being like an old white dude uh is like is like like make it becomes like a part of like becomes a part of it but that there's other ways to like have that effect um that uh like like my experience here has been um a lot of uh like I do like a little bit of teaching um, with like adults in the area and also like high schoolers. Um, and sometimes when they start talking about um, political things, I get very upset and I have to leave the room. Um, but like 98% of the time, um, we uh, engage with each other on very good terms. And I consider some of them I was gonna say I can I don't really consider any of them my friends, but I think they're all good people at heart. <laughs> um, I consider some of them. And and I and I think that like those kinds of interactions on like a on a on a person to person basis um, are really powerful. Where like I can interact with um, these people who have never seen a trans person before uh, outside of like the high school. Um, and like, I don't know, just like be sort of a force of chaos. <laughs> yeah, you gotta, you gotta do like John Lewis said, make good trouble. He's a memoir that he, I think he, if he's written a memoir, I need to find it because I think he would have good things to say. And I'm on the um, memoir kick right now. I think that, oh, go ahead, Scott. This is, this, this could be our closing quote. Just yeah, to, I just was going to say it's perfect. If you want to well, say it again, we'll close with yeah, that. I, I, I had a little Zoom with, with the, the environmental economist, Katarina Lynn, the other day. <laughs> 
and Katharina sort of collects people. And so everyone that she tells me about is amazing. And, and uh, this is a quote that I had to write down from her. Yeah, humans are shit, but some people are amazing. <laughs> I leave you with that. Thank you, Scott. That's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, please, if you can, join us on uh, August 5th for the opening of Overlap. And uh, this is recorded. So if you want to watch it again, you can watch it on our Facebook page, which was live streaming, or we'll have it packaged and on our website in a few days. So, all right. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. And again, be kind to each other. Thanks for Good coming, night. Maureen Connor. <laughs> <laughs>